The former police chief of Suffolk County is in prison, and now the district attorney and his chief of investigations, they've been indicted all over the same case. James Burke, former chief, he's now serving a 46-month sentence in federal prison. Burke's cruiser was broken into. The thief found embarrassing things like sex toys, pornographic movies. After the thief was caught, Burke shackled and then beat him and then try to cover it all up. Now, DA Thomas Spoda is facing witness tampering, obstruction charges, and the federal prosecutors say Spoda and the chief of investigations, Christopher McPartland, they had several meetings and calls with Burke where they discussed ways to cover up the assault. Feds also say Spoda pressured witnesses to lie to federal agents, gave false testimony, and withheld information from a grand jury. Want to bring in our legal panel to hash this out. Jim Kasouris, criminal defense attorney in Manhattan, sitting on the board of directors of the New York City Criminal Bar Association, frequently lecturing at New York Law School and the Bar Associations in Queens and New York City. Doug Von Oist, founding partner of Carson Von Oist, focusing on corporate misconduct and selected by the Legal 500 as one of the most influential trial lawyers in the nation and a Suffolk boy. Mayo Bartlett, an attorney at the law offices of Mayo Bartlett PLLC and a former chief of the Bias Crimes Unit at the Westchester County DA's office. And Bill Aronwall, good friend, defense attorney and former assistant U.S. attorney. Um, well, I start with you. Uh, you used to be a former prosecutor in the Suffolk County DA's office, and my God, the idea that the DA himself now indicted after what we saw the police chief and the chief of the investigations unit, it's a mess that seems to only be expanding here in Suffolk County. Well, the allegation is about as serious as it can get for uh, the top law enforcement official in that county. Um, you know, I was thinking immediately of all the prosecutions that have gone past and that are pending for that office, what this means to those prosecutions, to pe the people. I didn't even think of that. You're yeah. going to see a lot of people claiming that things were done to them, and it's, it's incredible. It really is. There's been a sense that Suffolk has always been almost its own entity. Um, it's on the far end of the island, if you will, and that there's almost a different set of rules in terms of oversight, et cetera. It's not... I'm not alone in communicating that. I've heard that from a lot of folks. Has this almost been, if not overdue, um, given what's happened both in that office and this police chief, that there was almost an inevitability. There's even more rumors circulating around here that there's been widespread abuse of power coming out of this police office and even some of the other uh, communities involved. Well, when I was an assistant district attorney in Suffolk County, I worked for Jim Catterson. I never worked for Tom Spoda. I was a prosecutor. I tried cases against Tom Spoda. I know Chris McPartland. I worked with him. I got to tell you, when I was out there, there was nothing but great prosecutors. It was completely, the place was fantastic, the way it ran, with integrity. Uh, this is very shocking to me. I don't know anything about this. Yep. Uh, it, it's incredible. Uh, it, Talk about the DA getting indicted, Jimmy. It's, it's uh, as Doug says, it's, uh, the, the allegations are very serious. But it also looks to me like it's a historical case that's going to be based. What does that mean? Well, what it means is they're, they're, they, they take what happened to Burke. They've been investigating and speaking to people for a while. I don't think they actually have any conversations that they partook in. So it's a historical case where cooperators are looking back and saying, this is what happened. And so you, you do need to be wary and, and give this some time. Let's see how the investigation pans out and, and how any trial would look. On the other hand, you don't it, it's not. DA it's you not case, no, right? it, it's not just rumors, though. I, there, there is so much rumbling going on out there, and there are actual investigations that that I'm aware of, of illegal wiretapping, the way a particular case was resolved against a defense attorney who was jailed and unjailed mysteriously. So there's a lot going on there, and I I, I would suspect that this is uh, not the first you're going to hear about. Uh, mm people getting indicted out there. And Bill, to that end, Doug mentioned um, about some pending cases and how it could impact it, but I, I got to imagine that f for the feds to take the role uh, and to get to where we are right now, this has a chance to go wide, well beyond just that one incident that happened in the precinct house. Well, yeah, I would think so. I mean, you know, th there's always been a tension between federal and local law enforcement. You know, uh, each one wants to one-up the other. Uh, when I was a prosecutor, you know, in, 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 in the Joint Strike Force, uh, one of our missions was to unite and bring together in a collaborative effort 
local and federal law enforcement. And there was so much distrust and resistance on the part of some agencies. For example, back then the FBI refused to work in any investigations with the New York City Police Department or local police departments because they felt that local police departments were ripe with corruption. And so, therefore, they didn't want to work. You know, it was a lot of arm bending and twisting and, you know, uh, in order to get them to sort of work together. In this particular situation, you know, I, I would not be surprised if Burke himself may be a cooperator. I mean, he got a 46-month sentence. Uh, he will be up for parole at some point. Uh, you know, if anybody knows what, what, what was done by the DA and by the uh, chief investigator to sort of bury this case and obstruct justice and tamper with witnesses, he would be the one, because I mean, yep. they were doing it for his benefit. So as to how far out this goes beyond Suffolk County, I don't know, but it's a nightmare for Suffolk County uh, uh, DAs, assistant DAs, because as Doug pointed out, anytime there's any indication that there was some misconduct by the DA, this is going to be front and center of any defense argument. You know, there'll be a lot of trials. Yeah, you know, be a lot of trials. No one's possibly, taking a plea. And possibly <laughs> a lot of motions to reverse sure. convictions based upon prosecutorial misconduct. Uh, it's interesting because sometimes from the outside, and you yourself, um, as we mentioned, worked in the DA's office, Westchester. We say, oh well, there's there's the tension, as Bill referenced, between the feds and, and and the local officials, but also between the police and the DA's office. From you guys working with you guys, Velasquez, it seems that it's almost healthy that there's a church and state between the two. And not always, and sometimes they work across purposes, but if there's too much that it's a common team, there's a risk inherent with that. And we don't know all the facts here, but when you have the DA allegedly and the police chief working in cahoots to cover up something, it takes a lot to get to that point, I would imagine. Oh, it definitely takes a lot to get to that point. Um, and, and just to follow up on what Doug said, look, I, I, in the DA's office, if you had told me any of my colleagues would engage in any misconduct, I would have been shocked because these are people I had personal relationships with, I got to know. And later I learned that some of them did engage in, in things that certainly would have been at a minimum prosecutorial misconduct. When you look at the relationship between police departments and local prosecutors, uh, it's an essential relationship, but it's got to be one of being above board and trust. So when you have that relationship and it works well, you know, the DA is supposed to be a legal advisor. They're not out there on the street making arrests, and the police are supposed to come to the district attorney before they make the arrest, if possible. So when you have a good working relationship, it's great. When you don't, you can even find situations like we had in New York City a few years ago where the police simply stopped making arrests altogether. And Sometimes you find out that a lot of the arrests didn't need to be made, but then there are arrests that absolutely need to be made that aren't going to be made. One of, the, one of the things you have to realize is that, you know, where there are instances of uh, police misconduct, police abuse, police corruption, the DA is the one who prosecutes those cases. Right. So, so basically, uh, in my days when I was an assistant DA and I basically handled a lot of police cases where I indicted police officers for you know, abusing prisoners and so on and so forth, you develop a reputation where you're sort of like taboo on the part of those police who are not part of internal affairs. The internal affairs guys love you yeah. because you're the, the go-to guy, but the other cops uh, who, who uh, bring cases into the DA's office, they're very leery of working with you because they just they don't trust you. And for the same reason, a lot of ADAs are afraid, district attorneys are afraid to bring charges against police officers because you, you create that same mistrust. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to pivot now from Long Island and uh, go over to New Jersey. When we come back after the break, the defense continues in the Menendez corruption trial. We're going to take a look at both the strategy and whether or not the New Jersey senator will or should take the stand. Stay with us.